or with less. Uh, I'd like to read just one sentence from the uh, uh, publicity piece that uh, um, Murat uh, told me basically summarizes his uh, research activities. And he says the focus of his research team at ABE and SIAC is to engineer auto, uh, autonomous plant growth and health sensing and monitoring systems, climate control technologies, and alternative energy applications to create resource use efficient controlled environment agriculture systems. And I'll let him explain what all of that means. Okay, and thank you, uh, Rafi, again, and then thank you, Jean, for the invitation. And also, I'd like to thank you uh, who are in the classroom here and uh, those of you who might be uh, following us from the, uh, from the web. So uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, resources efficient controlled environment agriculture uh, 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 systems through smart sensing, monitoring, and climate control technologies. And I, will, I would like to give you a little bit of flavor about some of our recent past research activities and ongoing research activities that are relevant to, uh, to this topic and some of the thoughts that I have uh, in, this, in this context. So uh, this is our challenge. We have to produce uh, more food in the upcoming 30, 35 uh, years, uh, more than the food that was generated in the history of the world. And we are supposed to do this, hopefully, by using less land and not needing more water and hopefully with environmentally friendly uh, agricultural systems and technology uh, platforms. And the scientific research is also indicating that the climate change has adverse effects on food, energy, and, and water. So the temperature increase can drop crop yields, require, it may require more irrigation, um, and there's uh, a, a close connectivity between energy and water in agriculture and that connection is actually very uh, vulnerable uh, to climate change. So in our case here in Southwest, uh, for Arizona and for major crops or in similar climates, uh, the yields could drop significantly per degree uh, temperature rise or irrigation needs can will be increased significantly if the production area is, is uh, significantly larger. So these disturbances would be felt locally uh, and across our region and also in similar regions and also affecting the food supply chains to, uh, to several major cities here in the, in the United States as well as in similar in, 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 in other places around the world. So if you look at the yield trends uh, for major field uh, agriculture-based crops, the trend is, yield trends is insufficient to double the global uh, production, uh, crop production to meet this uh, requirement by 2050. So <clears throat> we will need different kind of solutions uh, and, and supportive structure and alternative mechanisms for food production systems desirably producing food with less resources and in an environmentally friendlier way. I don't, I don't want to mean that this is going to come all uh, 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 from controlled environment agriculture uh, platforms, but the controlled environment agriculture technology and, and platform can be a mechanism or supporting a structure to meet or to help meeting this challenge to provide food and to feed the people, increasing population in the world because we are, uh, we can minimize use of resources uh, in an environmentally friendly way, a less disturbance from the outside environment in controlled environment agriculture uh, systems. So another proposal, major proposal is also to use 
precision agriculture. And precision agriculture, people have been more f uh, familiar with this terminology uh, for the field-based agricultural applications, but controlled environment agriculture actually has been appreciating and using precision agriculture under uh, structured and more confined controlled environments and we reach to a certain maturity now and this technology is evolving every day and we will see more uh, advanced precision agriculture systems in, applied in controlled environment uh, settings. When we talk about precision agriculture we mean a systems, um, a higher uh, order of systems management by measuring things, by measuring of, uh, various uh, key variables in the production uh, system, analyzing that data, and and to better manage the whole production system. So the goal here is not just increasing the yield or the revenue, but focusing also on minimizing the resources use. In a sense, we are basically looking at this term, what we call resource use efficiency, uh, defined as the ratio of yield uh, to the amount of resources uh, consumed. Um, the micro precision technologies uh, have been also evolving, advancing, and available has been available for controlled environment plant production systems. When we talk about micro precision technology, it doesn't always mean a higher order, a higher uh, orders of engineering precision, but refer, it refers to a technology or an approach to identify first what is needed. For the, from the plant canopy or the system, how much of that resource is needed and when to deliver that resource in a prescribed way to optimize resources. Then the, the technology and the approach can also take an action uh, to qualitatively and quantitatively meet the specific needs of the crops or the uh, production uh, system uh, itself. Some of the micro precision, uh, micro precision techniques are speaking plant approach, artificial intelligence, uh, biorobotics or biomechatronics. Some of these uh, technologies and platforms are invasive and contact and their uh, use is limited because of the contact and invasive nature of these uh, technologies. So what we really look for or we desire more is to use non-invasive, non-contact technologies, monitoring systems if we were to establish a real-time monitoring and control applications in controlled environment agriculture uh, systems. So automated crop diagnostics and decision support uh, systems are among emerging automation technologies. So to under in understanding of how plants actually interact with their surrounding environment is really essential for improving climate control strategies or resource management for improved uh, crop production in CEA uh, systems. So by monitoring, as you can see on these uh, couple of images here, by monitoring plant responses under a given environmental condition, um, we can collect the data and that data can be used to compare uh, crop over time and space uh, to help advancing the information for uh, climate control. You're looking at some of the available technologies out there used by the industry. The limitations today with these technologies are the lack of or the limited information regarding to the general status of the plant um, uh, uh, and use of that information for uh, decision making in, in, in processes that are used in, in greenhouses. So this has been one of our main focus in the recent past. In a couple of years ago, we worked on a, a multi-sensor, multi-camera uh, platform uh, using computer vision application as serving as a digital eye on the plant, uh, looking at some of the key features, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the color, texture, temperature information, so looking at the multi-spectral information, as Pedro mentioned to you, to understand the plant uh, growth uh, status, as well as determine anomalies as the plant goes through a stress cycle. So this is kind of a miniature version of the TerraGen system that Pedro um, talked about in his, um, in his um, uh, presentation. So the, basically, we have several cameras that are looking at these features 
and, and processing the data uh, on the background through data mining and statistics to bring an image, a heat image like this for the operator indicating the stress location or local, uh, local anomalies to make improved uh, decisions for the, for the user. So this um, approach and the system uh, has been uh, interesting for a couple of uh, companies out there and as we speak there is a, a consideration right now to integrate this approach uh, for the existing uh, uh, crop monitoring system to improve the uh, capabilities. Um, Internet of Things, IoT, or, or also known as Internet of Everything, uh, is also among emerging automation uh, technologies. IoT, or Internet of Things, refers to network of uh, physical objects or things, embedded electronics, sensors, and uh, connectivity to communicate the data among these objects as well as with the operators or the managers. Uh, to make improved uh, decisions. Um, we, are, we are already seeing a huge uh, uh, development in this area and we will be seeing more use of these IoT technologies, embedded systems, uh, wireless systems, plant monitoring, plant uh, sensing based climate control applications as well as remote uh, supervisory uh, applications in the controlled environment agriculture systems to improve resource use uh, efficiency. The use of smart systems and technologies with mechanization and all, uh, robotics applications can also help improving the resource use efficiency in CEI system. The commercial greenhouse operations using uh, robotics uh, in controlled and structural environments, in structured environments, uh, are advantageous because we have so many repetitive tasks, and this makes actually the use of robotics attractive uh, alternative to uh, 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 minimize and help optimize in labor use in controlled environment agriculture uh, systems. The biggest cost, if you look at any any industrial applications, one of the major costs is the labor cost. And in the greenhouse business, this cost actually uh, is about 30 35 percent of the overall uh, input for the greenhouse uh, operations. So some of the robotic systems, as you see on this slide, has been developed, and some of them are commercially available and practical, economical, while some of them were not. Uh, practical and economical uh, because they, for their justification of their use uh, was, uh, uh, was, uh, was not easy uh, because of the time it takes for the robotic system to recognize objects and then and the completing the task uh, is not practical uh, yet. Also working in a greenhouse condition is challenging under varying conditions with variability of the objects to be recognized has been some of the uh, challenge for the development of robotics. However, all these difficulties did not stop engineers or innovators to come up with robotic systems, and this sector is, is really uh, advancing. So we will see more uh, robotics uh, developments in the, uh, in the future that could be applicable for the uh, greenhouse systems. However, we will also need innovations in terms of crop breeding, as well as production system uh, innovations to help the robotics systems to make this uh, process more practical and more affordable, uh, uh, more applicable in greenhouse uh, operations. So I'm going to switch to a different topic that we are working uh, with our research activities. The cities are economic growth engines and they're fast growing and as you know that the urban population is really increasing as we speak the urban population accounts for about 55% of the total world population. And this is going to be uh, at a rate of 75% and 6.4 billion people is expected to live in urban settings by 2050. When you look at urban uh, localities, uh, the challenge is the fresh food, the fresh food challenge uh, in, in urban settings. And you know that average food miles in the United States is about 1,500 miles from the source to the to the table. 
Uh, so there has been a lot of interest in terms of uh, growing fresh food in urban settings using greenhouses on top of buildings, rooftop farming, and also with this type of technology called indoor plant factories or vertical farming to produce food using artificial uh, lighting. These are some of the uh, uh, systems, uh, uh, commercial uh, operations in, in US, in Indiana, New York, uh, New Jersey, and Michigan. Uh, using indoor plant uh, factories. There are some advantages and disadvantages with this type of technology. Uh, full control of the system, hydroponic systems are used. The fresh and local production is possible, is possible uh, with high productivity and capacity um, and also capability to save uh, resources. However, there are also challenges uh, in terms of uh, using the systems, high initial cost for the investment, limited number of crops can be grown, most of the leafy crops are grown in this uh, uh, production systems, intensive energy input mainly for running the uh, electrical lighting systems as well as the conditioning the environment for cooling and dehumidification systems. Also because of the vertical nature of the system, the uniformity or the, the uh, there's a lack of uniformity of the climate in these uh, production uh, uh, systems. So there is actually a need to engineer these uh, air conditioning systems to make these uh, uh, production platforms more economical uh, for certain crops and for certain applications. Um, and when you closely look at these production systems, as you can see, a large warehouse is converted into a vertical farm. On one side, the production is ongoing, and as you can see here, uh, there is not much production going on, but the room is conditioned using the energy uh, to operate these systems. And because of the lack of uniformity, the operators are uh, trying and trying and going through some error and trials uh, to uh, bring the conditioned air more into the production space where the crop is actually uh, located. Um, so, knowing these challenges and the interest uh, and knowing that there are uh, non-uniformity climate, non-uniformity related issues with the crop production, such as in the case of lettuce here with tip burn, this is a calcium deficiency induced disorder because of lack of turbulent flow uh, and lack of calcium uptake uh, in that kind of uh, production systems. Um, we we were, we were uh, focusing on developing or designing alternative uh, air distribution systems to bring air vertically down to the canopy so we could help minimizing the occurrence of these tick burn uh, disorder. So as you can see here, we propose to design a perforated air tubing system, which is also used in greenhouse operations, but in a miniature smaller scale, to push air into the canopy to uh, create a turbulent flow to minimize the uh, lettuce uh, tip burn. Going through these design features or coming up with alternative strategies, designs, uh, experimentally uh, doing this work is really challenging, time consuming, resource intensive. So we have been taking advantage of computational fluid dynamics, which is kind of a simulation and modeling based approach to, to design uh, and evaluate various scenarios uh, for uh, alternative design options. And this simulation uh, tool, it also gives us capability to go into the details, look, look into the details of the airflow patterns, uh, the uh, transport and exchange of uh, mass and the heat transfer between plant canopies and also the system or the surrounding air. As you can see here, we are able to analyze the airflow, look into ways to improve uniformity and and kind of to meet the desired conditions for the plant, uh, enhancing the plant uh, productivity. We're not only able to look at uh, key features such as air velocity distribution or the temperature distribution, uh, but also other types of key features that are desired for plant production. We're looking at a heat, uh, so we're looking at an air temperature distribution actually under certain uh, scenarios, uh, depending on the design and the configuration of this system. So this proposed approach and the design was actually uh, adapted 
and being considered for implementation by one of our industry collaborator as we speak. Uh, and our pre preliminary previous work was kind of targeting and looking into a single shelf, single payer uh, system. But now we are trying to, we are working on developing more complete models that can also consider plant existence. So plants also uh, 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 has an effect in terms of air flow and exchanges in that environment. So we are working on developing more complete models considering the effect of plant uh, transpiration, the CO2 exchange, and other processes between the plant and surrounding uh, climate. Also implement this to a larger production systems going from a single tier system. Now we are going to consider a larger multi tier uh, vertical uh, farm operations to look into ways or compare various uh, uh, design features uh, for uh, improved uh, air distribution system alternatives and help uh, for the for the users or manufacturers of, uh, of these systems out there in the industry. In vertical farm systems, I believe we also need uh, uh, a smart uh, light control technologies using plants as the sensor or we're using plants to really control their environment. And one of the applications that I see as possibilities is in biofeedback based smart LED lighting control system. And thanks to the uh, technology development with the UAVs, now we have miniature cameras with multi-spectral capabilities. So we are currently working uh, here uh, in our lab using a drone adaptive uh, uh, multi-spectral cameras to look at plant canopy expansion or multi-spectral features that can be detected from the plant and using that information to control the light intensity or, or quality uh, in the production system. So this would eventually help uh, optimizing the energy use uh, in that uh, uh, indoor plant factory uh, operations. You're looking at here the growth uh, uh, or the expansion of canopy that can be actually tracked in real time and use that information for control purposes. In, in any kind of controlled environment agriculture system, the, the, the climate control uh, platform generates huge amount of data sets. And, and there are uh, some insights and details that, could, that are really useful to make improved decision uh, making to optimize resources. So especially in vertical farm systems, this, this, is, this is also needed. Uh, so I believe that <clears throat> Uh, there is a need for uh, dynamic data analytics dashboards and also decision support systems to receive the data in real time, to analyze the data in real time, and to help making improved decisions for the operator or asking the system to make these control adjustments on the go uh, is also needed to improve resource use efficiency. So we are working on, this is a platform, a dashboard data analytics platform that we designed uh, to look at uh, key variables in real time in the production system as well as the history of the data can be tracked uh, by the system to make uh, improved uh, decisions. We just actually recently completed uh, the uh, establishment of our vertical farm uh, facility here at the CEAC uh, as a fruit of uh, a university and industry partnership uh, targeting to work together, actually aiming to work together uh, with research and technology development to help uh, the industry in addressing some of these challenges that I mentioned uh, to you. And also use this facility as a mechanism to, uh, for information uh, dissemination to the general public, as well as to uh, help uh, expanding our uh, facilities for uh, our educational program offerings. Uh, technology without educational support, without education is prone to failure. And this is one of the main challenge right now in the industry, in the controlled environment agriculture industry, is the lack of uh, a task force who are educated to operate, manage these systems in a more resource use efficient way. So we called it UAG Farm. And um, uh, we're hoping that uh, this, this will be a test bed for research or a facility for research, education, and outreach activities. So I'm going to slightly change to another topic that we kind of work on. 
and this is integrating alternative energy systems to control the mom and agriculture applications. And I like to say that in order to meet the global energy demand with clean energy, clean renewable energy applications such as the solar photovoltaics, we will need large surface areas to produce the energy. And we also need to produce food. So these two actually compete with each other. So there's an interest in utilizing agrivoltaics to kind of couple these two technologies, power generation and food, food production technologies, to lessen the competing challenge that we see uh, today. And this challenge is actually more intensified by the increasing population. Uh, there are some possibilities, and research has been going on, integrating photovoltaic systems into greenhouse uh, operations to provide the power uh, demand of the greenhouse uh, system. Um, and, and the prices are also uh, becoming lower. And, and, and as you can see here, in the past six, seven years, 50%, 60% reduction on the installation cost of the photovoltaics per watt uh, basis. And the technology is advancing with different types of photovoltaics applications. And we started our research a couple of years ago uh, with uh, uh, internal funding here to evaluate the limitation and capabilities of an off-the-grid greenhouse system, uh, which can be used for remote sites and you know uh, resource-challenged sites. So we demonstrated that we would be able to maintain the desired climate for plant production, and also demonstrate the pl that plant production is same as those coming from the grid-connected uh, systems. Um, Later on, we worked with a different technology, this time with interest coming from the industry, uh, to work with us on luminescent solar concentrated uh, and semi-transparent PV integrated glazing technology uh, here to kind of look into the effect of this technology for the climate as well as for the crops that are being uh, produced. This technology basically uses a low density silicon based strips to generate electricity and a luminescent uh, interlayer uh, embedded behind the panel uh, kind of uh, shifts the light color from green to red to provide more red and light for the plant, as well as enhancing the energy production capability uh, using uh, this technology. Recently, we, got, we received a, a funding uh, from Binational Agricultural Research and Development Program to really uh, look into other alternative technologies such as organic photovoltaics. This is another photovoltaics technology which is really gaining interest because of the tunability of the uh, the wavelengths and the and the um, uh, and the uh, PV panels uh, capability to produce massive quantities with uh, with a lower cost. Um, however, we are curious in terms of their uh, uh, energy production capability, their durability, their robustness uh, as a part of uh, glazing uh, used in greenhouse technology. So this is going to be a three-year project collaborating with World Kind of Research Center in Israel, as well as the Triangle Research and Development Center in Palestine. Um, if I believe that the PV integrated greenhouses can find applications for certain localities, climates, uh, in developed countries, but uh, I can imagine more possibilities and impactful applications for off-grid CEA systems for, to, pro produce, uh, to provide fresh food, safe food, and nutritious food in remote and resource-challenged localities such as refugee camps or remote uh, indigenous American reservations or remote forward operating bases, as you can see here, or in desert climates, as well as in Arctic communities where these challenges are more uh, significant. Um, finally, I'd like to mention uh, another research focus that we have related to alternative energy is sensor development or climate control application development to improve resource use in algae production systems. As you know, microalgae-based products are available, and there's interest, there has been interest for using that for biofuel production or for functional uh, foods and pharmaceutical sector, feed uh, for animals, or in aquaculture, as well as for cosmetics. And, and, and uh, two common methods to produce microalgae is using open pound photobioreactors in field conditions or 
closed tubular photobioreactor systems in greenhouse conditions or in controlled environments. Um, the challenge is the lack of monitoring and control systems that can be integrated to a real-time controlled applications. And also, some of the technologies available or the sensors available out there are either expensive or they cannot be used in real-time monitoring uh, applications. Um, another challenge is the algae crashing because of contamination issues uh, and being able to detect that in a timely fashion so we can save the resource that was used or, or save the labor that was invested in it and the total resource invested in that uh, production uh, system. So we need a real time, we needed a real time and a reliable monitoring application. So with that interest, through Department of Energy funding and a collaborative effort here, uh, uh, we developed, we designed and we developed a multi-wavelength optical density based sensor unit uh, that was capable of monitoring algae, microalgae biomass and health conditions in real time. And we uh, have now a US patent file for this uh, technology and we have been working with our collaborators from Texas A&M as well as uh, PNNL and uh, New Mexico State University to evaluate the robustness and the accuracy of our uh, sensor uh, unit for the past uh, year or so. Uh, we are now able to monitor uh, the biomass production and the health of algae um, in minutes or seconds basis as opposed to sending someone, an educated person to the field to bring the sample to the lab, sample preparation to make a judgment on the biomass health and the growth to make a decision to manage the resources. Um, monitoring was done. Now we, need a, we needed an approach actually to detect the crashing or to detect the algae health condition in real time as well. So we are uh, using our uh, data that is available from the sensor unit and other uh, key variables. We used machine learning and predictive modeling approach in a simulation uh, environment to detect algae crashing before the symptoms could be visible to a human observer or human eye. So using our uh, inline sensor that we developed as well as machine learning applications or modeling, we were looking at the discrepancy or the deviation from an expected growth under a climatic condition. So whenever you see that discrepancy, that would indicate a, 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 an anomaly in the production to provide the warning that was needed to make an a, a action. Uh, so you're looking at that approach here, that strategy we used. I'm just showing you just one variable uh, because of space limitation, but the, but the approach is actually looking at three other features, key features, to, uh, uh, to keep track of this trend and then to detect the anomaly. So here we see the crashing, but um, the model prediction is really uh, nice and, and perfect uh, here with the model that was used. And this is a simulation environment actually, actually using the neural network based predictive modeling and some decision making here, some statistical uh, approach based decision making to make the judgment and counting the flags uh, based on the measurements to make a judgment and provide that information to the operator. So as you can see, under the growing conditions, if there is no flagging coming from the uh, detector or the sensor unit or the climate control strategy, we don't see any flags indicated. However, as the algae starts going through crashing, we would see increased number of uh, flaggings and warning, providing that warning uh, to the operator. And with this approach, we demonstrated that a day or a day and a half earlier detection is a possibility. Now this was through simulation. Now we're interested in implementing this experimentally in our test beds here as well as in our collaborating uh, uh, collaborator uh, stations. So these are some of the things that we have been working on, <clears throat> trying to develop sensors, control strategies, integrating different uh, type of systems to help improve in resource use efficiency in controlled environments. So with that, I'd like to stop here and conclude. But before I do that, I'd like to also acknowledge and thank to those um, who worked on all of these 
like to acknowledge my current lab members as well as all former members. They do the hard work I just talked here. So, and I also I would like to acknowledge my uh, colleagues and collaborators as well as those who provided us uh, the sponsorship. Without their help in the moment, this uh, would not be possible. So thank you for the Thank you. Thank you, Murat. I think the sense that I get from both of these talks is that we have just seen a glimpse of the future, and the future is very bright. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions, and uh, Dr. Jensen is first. You know, I can, uh, it's really amazing. I was up to six years old. We had horses. You come a long way, Pedro. Uh, Pedro, one of the things that I find very important, and we do this in greenhouse, but I think application in open field, and you could probably do this, and that's vapor pressure deficit, measuring, you know, humidity, temperature as to when the plant is very active. And we know uh, that the more hours per week, it has a reflection on yield, especially for crops multi-harvest. So for, for us, uh, I do a lot of work in California with open field with the, in Salinas. It would be very interesting if you're not, if you could add that to all your other sensors, or you probably have those sensors now, you could put it into a graph. So that would be fantastic. Pedro, you may want to use this. Um, any other questions? Yes, come in, Jack. Excellent presentations. There are a couple of points that come up. One is that you put the emphasis on phenotype, but the integration of genotype, phenotype, and the environment in which plants grow. If you were explaining this to a congressional panel as far as how is this helping our America, it's obvious that you're saving water, there are a number of other things, but to the Consumer, where is there a better type of cotton or a better type of food or better product that's coming in as the end product of what you're doing? And the other component to this is when you've looked at the photosynthesis side of things, you have the big data here that I think you could extract out where you're converting CO2 to oxygen. And that would be very meaningful for the public to understand. Okay, very briefly, yeah, we call these studies uh, G by E experiments. So it's the genetics in, uh, in the environment that we test them. So it's it, that's the emphasis of our work to test to test um, this this germplasm in the environment that they will be growing eventually. And where I come in these projects is I provide expertise on the instrumentation and uh, the systems to to make these experiments uh, flexible and and make them uh, um, the data collection to to have the quality of information that we need. Uh, but then there is a, a large group of people whose expertise is in 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 um, plant breeding and crop physiology. And they are better suited to the selection process and the eventually what they're after is gene discovery. Okay? And that's well beyond me. I, I'm I'm an engineer that provides this 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 background uh, to to accelerate these this, uh, selection processes. But in the end it's a it's a, it's a joint effort. Uh, and many disciplines come in place. And that partially answers that, that question um, that was in the back um, on how we can use especially thermal infrared uh, to characterize that the response of the, of the crop to um, um, ambient conditions. Morat, do you want to comment on yes. that? Yeah, I think uh, Pedro responded this really well. So I think now we have uh, um, a lot more capabilities in terms of the technology available. We're, you know, able to generate huge data uh, data sets that can help improving these uh, uh, breeding processes and coming up with varieties or crops that are more resistant to the environmental challenges. And at the end, uh, you know, there could be you know uh, possibilities to have crops or varieties that uses resources less and we would not pollute the environment. 
so everything that we discussed here at the end is kind of targeting the consumer, the environment, and the resources that we have. So I think that's a very um, important point that you made, Jack. Another point comes up in regard to the algae side, and often we see things on the news in regard to a contamination of a river or a contamination even in the Gulf of, uh, well, Mexico with, with a oil spill and the other types of contamination. And algae is often looked at as the bad guy. Now, how do we go ahead and engineer and utilize sensors and utilize better technologies to harvest that which we see as contaminant algae and convert that into something worthwhile? That's, yes, that's a new uh, area, a new challenge, yes. Uh, uh, but, yes, so the, 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 uh, there, were, there are actually satellite-based imagery to kind of detect algae, you know, uh, in the contamination or algae uh, growth in, in oceans and rivers and to kind of look at management uh, alternatives to, to kind of mitigate that. So, um, but you're right, you know, the detection capabilities, the technology has been there and it's already advancing, but trying to decide in terms of what to do with that and then convert that into a usable uh, product is, is, I think, is evolving as, as we speak. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that's important too, I think, yeah. Okay, um, I'm gonna, we've got a lot of good positive comments from mm. out in the ethernet. Um, People say it was a very interesting talk. And here's a question. Any device to know the MRL in fresh produce without sending produce samples to a laboratory? MRL? Can you can you help me? Repeat that question to the group so that we have a good sense of what he's trying to get at. Is there any sensor out there to detect the MRL uh, before sending the sample to the lab? So if uh, our uh, 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 if they can elaborate on that, uh, yeah, do, do uh, any one of you know what the we, we I guess we need some elaboration on that question. Uh, and I'll, let's see, okay, um, and he means pesticide, pesticide residues in fresh produce. Um, that's, 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 a, that's uh, you know, uh, the uh, hyperspectral imaging has been used to look at cont contam contamination or pesticide residues on, on produce, uh, but uh, the challenge is to really differentiate that chemical uh, contamination uh, and the, the constituent in that chemical contamination. So um, uh, I, I am not sure at this point to tell that if there's a specific application that is capable of telling a, a, a certain chemical contamination is detected from a produce, but the technology again is there. I think through, uh, through uh, imaging and some uh, uh, probably machine learning is a possibility, I, I, I believe, but I'm not aware of uh, any direct sensor that is out there at the moment to, to do that. Yeah. Well, just quickly, I want to I want to make a comment on, on that side. Is is that we've made very good progress in in compositional analysis and, and sensor based um, uh, approaches, but to detect a contaminant, it takes uh, uh, to to a to a, a different level. And it's it's really not 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 absolutely. So uh, I will say this: we have technology to to look at the response of the plant to abiotic stress, abiotic stress. Very good. I will say we 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 done good progress. Compositional, uh, some also uh, I think is is improving, but that area is is hard. Okay. Um, and let's see what we have here. Talk to the challenges of off-grid CEA, a most viable use case. Uh, clarifying the acronym so everybody knows what it is. 
The, the off-grid uh, CEA is what we mean is that a grid, the controlled environment uh, food production system that is off the grid, not connected to the, 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 to the grid providing the energy and the power. So with that, as I mentioned, you know, there are some possibilities and applications. Um, for instance, remote locations where uh, people may not have direct or immediate access to the power or a steady energy uh, or a power in that location. There are locations around the world, especially in developing countries, even the power is available, it is not reliable. Uh, or to bring that energy to that side is, uh, is not cost effective. Um, and I mentioned a couple of other alternative applications uh, that was on the slide. So I would uh, see those as possibilities, but in, in, in developed countries uh, also uh, we can uh, look into strategic integration of uh, uh, photovoltaics with uh, food production systems in greenhouses. Uh, island locations in islands, uh, those would be some, uh, those would be possibilities. Um, it will be at the end to make a decision on the specific crop. There might be some shade tolerant crops because it's really counterintuitive in greenhouses to install a photovoltaic system on the roof of the greenhouse where you really need light transmission into the greenhouse, but there might be crop that could tolerate that. Um, and then that would enable to, uh, re to generate a revenue uh, with that integration rather than just producing the, uh, the crop. As I said, the technology is really is, it is advancing. There are so much, so many possibilities with photovoltaics. So we have to kind of step into and, and into doing research to really evaluate this technology to see what are the capabilities as well as the limitations to help the manufacturers of these uh, technologies so we can in the future hopefully find a practical economical application. One more question, if there is one. No? Well, I want to thank both of you, Pedro and Murat, for two fantastic presentations bringing us to the edge of development in agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.